Grab your Bibles. Let's get ready to go to the Word. Um, I just want to share from my heart just briefly what the Lord is saying and what God is doing. So you're going to need to open your Bibles and you're going to need to keep them open uh, this morning. I wanted to thank my lovely wife for um, filling in uh, last week. Amen. Bless the Lord. Yeah. 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 She's getting dangerous at home. I can't use big theological words no more because now she knows what they mean. And uh, yeah, she's getting educated, seminary student, and she's doing well, and I really love it. Um, I love the fact that this is her season, and I feel what she felt when I was doing that, um, because I see how quick I get on her nerves now. Amen? Yeah, I can't say nothing right, man. It's like, no time for a brother, no time for nothing, um, because she's in the books. So my prayer is like, Lord, take those books away. Yeah. <laughs> Replace them with me. So I'm feeling deprived here, you know. <laughs> but I'm excited about it. I, he's a brave man. I'm excited about Pastor Kay. I'm excited about what she's doing. Um, what's interesting is um, as I study with her, and um, the, the problem with me studying with her is I'm one of the professors at the seminary, so I can't help her with her stuff, you know, because it'd be like cheating, you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> but I, it's, it's just really exciting to kind of watch what she's doing and to listen to her and watch the growth in her. So celebrate her a little bit as she's going through that. Thank you, my love. Amen. Amen. Bless you. Yeah. Yeah. Bless you. Yeah. Bless you. Grab your Bibles, let's pray, and then we're going to go to the Word of God and just share briefly what God is um, saying. So, Holy Spirit, open our hearts to hear, open our hearts to understand, to be in tune, to, um, as we go to your Word on this, the first Sunday of Passion Week, uh, speak afresh to us, God. Let us see who you are. Bring to remembrance the things that have been dis- deposited. I pray for strength as we share these two services that you get the glory out of everything that's said. So we thank you, we love you, we worship, and we adore you. It is in your name we pray and thank you. Amen. Amen. Turn to your neighbor real quick and say, neighbor, this week, praise the Lord for who he is. Yeah, turn to your other neighbor and say, other neighbor, this week, we want to praise the Lord for who he is. Amen. I'm going to be speaking from the book of Luke, but before you go there, there's some pretext stuff that I need to give you. But I just want to say briefly as we kind of talk to the message this morning that for most modern day Christians, when we think of Jesus, our thought process is restricted solely to the benefits of following him and not the suffering associated with being a disciple of Christ. You can't get what I'm saying? I mean, think about it. Think about it, right? When we, when we worship God, when we testify about the goodness of God, it's always what he's done, um, not so much the reason he came and who he really is. Can, can, can I get an amen this morning? I mean, here's what a lot of our testimonies sound like. When we testify about God, he's the king of kings, and this is what we say, Lord of lords and a way maker and a mother to the motherless and a friend to the friendless. Come on. Uh, Come on. Bridge over troubled waters. Healer. Provider. We have all these nice words that we use to describe Jesus, but very rarely do we hear anybody in their testimony talk about the suffering Savior. Right? Very rarely, very rarely do we hear anyone talk about the fact that he was crucified on my behalf, that he died. Come on. He was whipped. He was bruised. Very rarely do we talk about that Because I've come to the realization that as believers in Christ, whether we say it or not, we we, we serve God so much more for the benefits of what we receive from being followers of Christ. And as a result of that, more times than often, we forget the true reason for which he came into the earth. And so here's what happens when we go on these evangelistic um, rampages and we decide to tell somebody about the love of God. Very, very rarely, do we, if ever, do we start our evangelistic approach like this. You know, you're going to suffer a little. <laughs> Come on, y'all. We, we, we don't say that, right? You know, it's okay to be broke. Come on, y'all. The world's going to hate you. Come, can I get a witness? We don't do that. We talk about stuff like God can deliver you. God can heal you. God can make a way out of nowhere. God can do this. And the result is people sign up for what he can do for them 
versus who he is. And the sad commentary is when he doesn't do what we told folk he would do, we turn around and like we're going to see in the text, we say, crucify him. We say crucify him. Come on. We turn from praise into condemnation. And so I'm learning more and more that people today are no different than the people in the biblical days. Those same individuals that were in that passage that Pastor Katani read and that we're going to look at briefly today as we walk through this. We have this expectation. We have this hope. And we hang our hats more on what Jesus can do for us versus the purpose in which he came for us. So as we approach Holy Week, as we approach this Passion Week, as we approach this week where Jesus is about to make um, his final week of ministry on earth, I want to take a moment to remind us of who this King of Kings truly is, of who this King of Kings, um, what he came to do so we, we not lose sight of that and we get to the place where we can worship Jesus for who he really is, not so much for what he has done for us. And so as we look at Holy Week, Holy Week begins with this first Sunday that we call historically as Palm Sundays. It's the day where Jesus makes what's known as his triumphal entry into the city of Jerusalem to begin his final days of ministry on the face of the earth. Now, before you can appreciate this triumphal entry that Jesus is about to make as he goes into the city of Jerusalem, I think we need to back up a little bit to the book of Zechariah chapter 14. I need you to go there if you're able, Zechariah chapter 14, and I want you to read some context and to put you now in the framework and in the same mindset of the people who were shouting praises to him so you can understand the information that they had and the expectation that they had for this king that was going to come on the face of the earth. So if you go with me to Zechariah chapter 14, I just want to read the first nine verses so you can hear what the prophet is saying. Then I'm going to give you some context and then we're going to walk through the text this morning that God would move and have his way. Zechariah is in the Old Testament. If you're in the New Testament, you're in the wrong place. So um, back up a little bit that God would move and have his way. Let me hear a big amen if you're there. Amen. amen. Now, verse 1, I'm in the ESV. I'm going to read and I'll explain a little bit just to kind of give you up to bring you up to date. Then we're going to move over to the New Testament. So here's this word prophetically. Here's what the prophet, the minor prophet Zechariah is saying. And understand he's speaking prophetically to a people. So listen to what he says. Behold, a day is coming for the Lord when the spoil taken from you will be divided in your midst. For I will gather all the nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken and the houses plundered and the women raped. Half of the city shall go out into exile, but the rest of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then the Lord will go out and fight against those nations as when he fights on a day of battle. On that day, his feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives that lies before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mountain of Olives shall be split in two from east to west by a very wide valley, so that one half of the mountain shall move northward and the other half southward. And you shall flee to the valley of my mountains, for the valley of the mountains shall reach to Azal, and you shall flee as you fled from the earthquakes in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. Then the Lord my God will come, and all the holy ones with him, don't miss this, and on at that day there shall be no light, cold or frost, and there shall be a unique day which is known to the Lord, neither day nor night, but as evening time there shall be light." And on that day, living water shall flow uh, out from Jerusalem, half of them as the eastern sea and half of them as the western sea. It shall continue in a summer and in a winter. And the Lord will be king over all the earth on that day. The Lord will be one and his name one. Now, the reason I read that is if you are an Israelite and you're living in Jerusalem or you're living in Galilee and you have been oppressed for the majority of the existence of your nation, your expectation is when Jesus comes, it's going down. 
Oh, come on, y'all. Because you, you, you've been promised that you're going to be, that nations are going to bow before you. you. You've been promised historically and you've been promised biblically that God's going to make your name great and God's going to multiply your seed and all the nations of the earth are going to be blessed because of you. Yet, throughout the entirety of your existence as a nation of Israel, you've gone through oppression and if you've gone through being in slavery and you've gone through all these things and every time a prophet speaks, Speaks, the prophet makes a proclamation of what God is going to do. So understand with me now, when you hear the prophet Zechariah speak, you are listening through the lens that I can't wait for the Messiah to come because when the Messiah come, he's going to make things right. Oh, come on, y'all. Come on, come on, come on, come on. You're waiting with anticipation that when he come, it's going down. And, and, and you can handle and you can understand and, and go through oppression for a season because you're mumbling under your breath and saying to Nero and saying to Pharaoh and saying to the Roman Empire and saying to all these governors, all right, just wait. Jesus is coming. Yeah. And, and when he come, I'm going to sit on your seat just because I can. Come on, because you have an expectation that there's going to be deliverance. There's going to be a time where God has set you free. And after all, you have the words of the prophet Zechariah at, you dis at your disposal, and you're expecting that Jesus is going to come. Well, as time progressed, here's how I'm going to say this. Jesus snuck his way into the earth, and he came. And he's been on the earth now for 33 years. But the whole time he's been on the earth is 33 years. He's been living under the radar because he had not said publicly, I'm here. Understand that with me. Matter of fact, if you read scripture carefully, here's what you're going to see. Every time he healed somebody, every time he did something miraculous, here's what he would say. Go home and don't tell nobody because what? My time yeah, you kind of get it. You kind of get it. Now understand with me, if you're following Jesus and you hear him say that and you know the prophecy, you're looking at your buddies, it's fitting to go down soon. Yeah. And you're waiting with anticipation because you know right now he's keeping it hidden. He's keeping it under the radar, but the time is going to come when he's going to go public. At the time of the text, that day and that time, had arrived. Now, here's what you need to know about that day and that time, is that Zechariah himself had also prophesied how Jesus was going to make his entrance into Jerusalem. So if you back up to chapter 9 of the book of Zechariah, go to chapter 9, let's go there with me, and then look at verse 9 of that ninth chapter, you're going to see Zechariah making a prophecy about Jesus' entrance into Jerusalem and what that was going to look like. So say amen if you're in Zechariah chapter 9. And look at verse 9. Here's what the prophet says. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is doing what? He's coming to you. Come on, come on. Righteousness in heaven, salvation is he. Humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. So Zechariah is prophesying how Jesus is going to enter into Jerusalem. And mind you now, as a nation, as a people, I don't care how he comes. I've been oppressed for too long. I am more interested in the fact that he will come. You kind of get what I'm saying. And, and if I miss the details of what the author is saying to us, how he comes could slip my mind because even in his entrance, God is trying to communicate something different. But if my expectation is when he comes, I'm going to get mine, I will miss the message that God is trying to communicate. And the problem with the church today is because we don't pay attention to how he came, we miss the message. And more times than often throughout the entirety of our Christianity, we worship Jesus for what he can do, not because of who he is. Amen. So now we are in Luke. Go with me to Luke chapter 19. And look with me at Luke chapter 19, verse 28. Jump over to the New Testament. Let's connect the dots and then we're going to talk through this. So we can see what God is saying and what God is doing in our midst. Amen. 
If you're there, say amen. amen. Now, let me read, and then I'll explain, and then I'll draw a couple of applications, and then we'll be done for the morning. Verse 28 picks this up. After Jesus had done his earthly ministry, now he is at the beginning of Passion Week. He's at the beginning of Holy Week, and we begin with the celebration of what we call Palm Sunday, as Jesus makes his triumphant entry into Jerusalem. And verse 28 says this, And when he had said these things, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. And when he drew near to Bethpage and Bethany at the mount that is called Olivet, watch this, he sent two of his disciples saying, Go into the village in front of you, where on entering you will find a cold tide on which no one has ever yet sat. He says, Untie it and bring it here. Then I love this. It says, if anyone asks you why you are in untying it, you shall say this, the Lord has need of it. Now, briefly, let me just give you some, some literary context, lit, literal context on what's going on here. Normally, when a king goes into battle, and you have to understand with me, everything in the minds of the Israelites is saying to them that Jesus is coming now to overthrow the Roman government. Jesus is coming to set things straight. Jesus is coming to put us back in a place of prominence. And even though their mind is set on that initially, they miss the details of the text. Because here's what the text is trying to communicate. The cultural norm was this. When, when a king enters into battle, he doesn't come sitting on a donkey. Come on, come on. He comes on a horse. He comes riding as a victor and he has the spoils of the previous places that he has dominated, bringing it with them. And by virtue of the fact, the author is trying to communicate with us. If you notice how Jesus is coming, it's a lot different than the traditional kings would enter into a city. He's coming on a donkey. Don't miss this. And then it says, a unbroken colt. In other words, a baby donkey, if you will. He, he is coming, and here's what a donkey symbolizes. It symbolizes humility, and it symbolizes peace. Come on. And, and it symbolizes, I am not coming to make war, is what Jesus is trying to communicate. I'm trying to bring peace. I'm trying to bring a different type of peace. And, and because we don't know that about God, we miss that sometimes. So he said to his disciples, go into the city, untie this colt and bring it to me. And, and it's almost as if he had paved the way prophetically because here's what he says. If someone asks, why are you doing this? Here's his response to say to them, the Lord has need of it. Repeat after me. Come on, say the Lord, the Lord has, need has need of it. So look at this. Notice what the next verse says, verse 32. So those who were sent went away and found it just as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owner said to them, why are you untying the colt? And they said, same thing, the Lord has need of it. And then they brought it to Jesus and throwing their cloaks on the donkey, they sat on it and he rode along and they spread their cloaks on the road as he was drawing near already on the way down the Mount of Olives. Okay, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God. Let me not pass that cloak thing so quick. Because you got to understand, in the Old Testament, there was not prophecy, if anything, saying that cloaks will be spread on the road. So you've got to visualize this with these disciples of his and these people who were praising him. Their instruction was to go get the donkey and bring it back to Jesus. And they brought the donkey back to Jesus and they put Jesus on it. And notice what the text says. They took their cloaks off and they spread it on it. And they didn't only spread their coats on the donkey, but they laid their cloaks on the road where the donkey was walking and they cut palm branches and they laid that on the road this, I want y'all to see this. This is a form of what I'm calling red carpet service, if you will. Yeah. Hey, Jesus, if you're going to overthrow Rome, I know we don't have no silk, and I know we don't have no red stuff, but listen, if you're going to go into the city, we got to make, we got to make a declaration, and we've got to let, um, come on, Cyrus and the governor and all those people know that you fitting to take, oh, I wish I had somebody here, so we're going to make it look right, and they're celebrating, watch out, Rome, here we come, watch out, Rome, here we come, it's our turn, watch out, Rome, here we come. And most of us, when we read this, we thought it was pure celebration. 
they have a different mindset. They have a different mindset. Because watch the text. Watch the text. It says here, the whole multitude, verse 37, of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God in a loud voice and watch why they were doing this for all the mighty works they had seen. No different than you. No different than me. I praise him for what he did. Because I think he's going to do something different. And so we walk around like these people. I'm the head and not the tail. I'm above and not beyond. Come on. I'm the lender. Don't act like y'all ain't ever said it. And not the borrower. My day is coming. My deliverance is on the way. And all it is, it's about physical things because in our mind, we want God to overthrow the Roman government so we could sit on the throne. Come on, y'all. That's why we get excited. I feel it. I feel it. It's going to happen this week. And we spread red carpets. Can we go there? And then watch this. Verse 38. Saying, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace, where? In heaven. And glory, where? I love details in the text because verse 38 says nothing about peace on earth. It's about to go down. We're going to have some chaos in Rome, right? And verse 39 says, and some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to them, teacher, rebuke your disciples. Because if you read um, Matthew and Mark's and John's rendition, here's the reason the Pharisees were saying, be quiet. You're going to start an uproar in Rome. And if the Roman Empire hears the noise you're making, they are going to prepare for battle. Shh. Jesus is not like that. And here's disciples. You don't know who Jesus is. He fit to take over the throne. And I like this. And then Jesus rebuked, uh, he says, teach, rebuke your disciples. And he answered, tell them that if these were silent, because Jesus have a whole nother framework. I love this verse. The stones, the very rocks. I wish I had somebody in here is going to cry out. Now, let me say this parenthetically, and I want to back up and draw some application. What's sad to me in this celebratory passage is by the end of the week, these same people who had cut branches, these same people who had rolled out their version of the red carpet were the same people that were saying, release Barabbas and crucify him. Why did they switch? Is because they never expected a suffering Savior. I'll say it again. Why did they switch? Is because they never expected a suffering Savior. And my low moments, my low moments, my depressive moments is not when Jesus is making his entrance into Jerusalem, but my, my, my most difficult time in following him is when I expect him to overthrow Rome and he dies instead and I didn't expect that so I too am prepared to turn my back. And I think that's your moments as well. Come on, y'all. When you're going through, when it gets tough, and you say, Lord, where are you? And because he doesn't act the way we thought he ought to act, crucify him. And our praise turns into condemnation. Why? Because we miss the true reason for which he comes. But there's good news in the text. That's the literal part. And we'll flesh this out more this week as we go to the resurrection. There's some pointed applications that I want you to take away from this message today. There's truths. Because some of you are saying, I read this. I can see it. Okay, here's the so what. They miss what Jesus is saying. What is it saying to me today? Okay. 
I think what it's saying to you today is the same thing that it's communicating to us. That for those of us that know Christ as Lord and Savior, there comes a point in time when you too need to go to Jerusalem. I wish I had somebody in here. Y'all missing this. Acts chapter 1 verse 8 puts it this way. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you shall be my witnesses where? In Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, come on, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. So, so lock into this. There comes a place in time when, like Christ, God calls you and God calls me to go back into those places and do some unique things. And let me be careful in saying this to you. And if we don't understand the reason God sends us in, we will lay false expectation on people. If the only message you give them, I'm going to stick with metaphors, is I'm going to overthrow the Roman Empire, they will come to you looking for you to overthrow the Roman Empire and their response to the gospel is going to be one of faking the funk because their expectation is not freedom is promises from God. So I sign up because if I tithe, I'm going to get a house. Because if I serve him, he's going to bless me. Come on, he's going to make my marriage right. He's going to do all these things and I accept him because of what he can do, not because of who he is. So when Jesus sends you to Jerusalem, you got to hear me this morning. Don't get locked into the miracles and the signs and the wonders. That's secondary from, I wish I had somebody in here. That's secondary from the reason he's sending you. Ha, come on, say go to Jerusalem. Say it again, say go to Jerusalem. And you need to know why he's sending you to Jerusalem. Look at the text. Look at the text. When you go, he says, you're going to find, jump down to verse, what's that? 30. Go into the village in front of you, where you enter it, you will find a colt that is tied on which no one has ever sat. He says, do what? Untie it. Who, how many translations says loose it? Come on, I like that word. Who says loose it? Some of your translations says that. Good. Okay, I like loose it. Lou is the Greek word. Loose it and do what? Bring it to me. Here's the text. Here's what Luke says it in Luke chapter 4. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim what? Good news to the poor. Um, Set the proclaim liberty to the captive, the recovering of sight to the blind, and to set at free those who have been bound. Right? Here's why I go to Jerusalem. Because there's people in Jerusalem who are bound. I wish I had somebody. Who are tied. Who are caught up in stuff. And God sends me. And he's already prepared the way. Don't miss this. He sends me there. Lock into this. To untie them. And then to bring them to him. Oh, I wish I had somebody in here. You, you, you got to say one more time because y'all didn't get it. The, the reason you hear is because somebody went to Jerusalem. And, and don't make the mistake of thinking Jerusalem was the church. The Jerusalem was the drug house where you were in. The Jerusalem was the bad relationship that you found yourself in. Jerusalem was the addictive situation that had it. And because a disciple obeyed God, they went into Jerusalem and the word of God released you and it released me and it set people free from the th- that has them bound and the reason we go to Jerusalem is not to make people rich but to untie people who are bound oh you gotta hear me this morning there's a whole lot of bound folk come on in your very homes on the job in our neighborhood and the message to go ahead is to untie them untie them untie them and the problem with the church is you've got folk in the church that are coming looking for the Roman Empire to be overthrown and we want to sit in the seat but you never get there because you're still bound still bound and the focus of the gospel the focus of Jesus the focus of the word is not prosperity and riches 
even though that may come, that's not the focus. The focus is freedom. Come on, y'all. It's freedom. Holy Week is not about Jesus sitting on some throne in Rome. It's about him sitting on the throne. Yeah, yeah, you get it. Because here's what it looks like. When he sits on the throne of my life, the thing that had me bound no longer has me. Yeah, 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 yeah. See, grandma there might not be able to say it the way I said it, but they had a song they wrote about it. Satan had me bound. But Jesus, yeah, you kind of get what I'm saying, set me free. And it might not have been Palm Sunday for them, but they still sang glory, hallelujah, come on. Jesus set me free because they understood the true reason for him entering Jerusalem. It's to set us free. It's to set us free. Now lock into this. You're not set free for the mere pleasure of being set free. There's divine intention attached to your liberation. Here's what the text says. He didn't say untie it and let it roam. <laughs> untie it and do what? Yeah, yeah. The, the problem with a lot of us, and let me pick on preachers, preachers, is we want to untie folk and bring them to us. And we want to talk about my church, my people. No, 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 no. You didn't have the power to untie nobody. We untie them to bring them to Jesus. Come on. Are you with me? To point them to Jesus. To point them to Jesus. To point them to Jesus because he's the only one that has the capacity to set them free. Come on, say point people to Jesus. Say it again. Say point people to Jesus. One more time. Say point people to Jesus. So listen to this. You're set free because Jesus needs you. You're set free because Jesus needs you. Does this make sense? And then when you understand what God has done for you, right? Let, let, let me jump ahead, and I'm done. Let me jump ahead to the last of the text. It says here, and as he rode, verse 36, as he's rolling along, they spread these cloaks on the road, and they were drawing near Already on the way from the Mount of Olives, the multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with uh, what kind of a voice? Lock. What kind of a voice? For all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, blessed is he who comes, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord, peace on heaven and glory in the highest. And it says some of the crowd, the Pharisees, were saying, shut these people up. And Jesus answered, I tell you, if they were silent, the very what? Stones? I like that. I like that. I like that. I like that. Because a little over 10 years ago, I found myself bound with the issue of the sickness of cancer in my life. And then Jesus came and he untied me. Y'all not hearing me. He, he, he untied me, right? And, 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 and here's what I got to say. This is a parenthetic. How he untied me doesn't matter. But the fact is he untied me. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I need to say that for somebody because you got to understand, sometimes God will use the physicians. God will use whatever he needs to use. I wish I had somebody in here to untie me, right? Now, here's the beauty of why I just said that. Because I know his purpose and for coming into the world was to untie me. Number one, he untied me from the bondage of sin. That was first and that was foremost, that I have a relationship with him, that I know him, that I make him king of my life. And because now he wants me to come to him and to use, for his, for his, use me for his purpose, if anything stands in the way of his purpose, he can untie that thing until I finish what he calls me to do. So here's what this means now. You think any Pharisee can shut me up? And on this Palm Sunday, some of you have been through some situations. Some of you have been through some storms. 
Some of you have been through some trials. Some of you have been through some circumstances. God has delivered you. God has untied you from some crazy things. And on this Palm Sunday, I stopped by long enough to let you know if you know what God has done for you because of who he is. Come on. You ought not let no rock cry out in your place. You ought to praise him because of who he is. He's a great God. He's a phenomenal God. He's a mighty God. I'm here because he untied me. You're here because he untied you. The least we can do is praise his name. The least we can do. The least we can do. The least we can do is spread some cloaks on the ground in his presence. Come on. The least we can do is walk on his Jesus. It belongs to you. The least we can do. The least we can do. Because nobody untied me but he himself. Come on, stand to your feet all over this building. Stand to your feet all over this building. And let's take a moment just to praise him. Come on, just to celebrate him for who he is. In your own way, just thank him this Palm Sunday. Say glory to him. Bless his name. He deserves it all because of who he is. We thank you, God. We bless you, God. We give you praise. We give you glory, God. You deserve all praise. You came to Jerusalem just for me. Just for me, God. Number one, to bring me into relationship with you. And then, God, you set me free. You delivered me, and for that, I thank you, God. For that, I give you praise. For that, I give you glory, God. So on this Passion Week, me sacrificing something for you is no big deal. Me coming to worship you on a Wednesday and a Friday and to reflect on the table is no big deal. Let me not be guilty of saying crucify you because of the false hope that I have on who you are. As you die, I must die. So on this Palm Sunday, God, I die so you can live. On this Palm Sunday, God, we're waving palms, but we're willing to die because you did. So if there's one here, God, that don't know you as Lord and Savior, draw them, draw them, draw them, draw them. Let them understand that you didn't come for all the fancy stuff, but you came to give your life so we can have life. We give ourselves to you, God, because you thought we were worth saving. So we give it all to you, God. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, God, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, God, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, bless your name, bless your name.